It is. It is. And the instruction that you proposed that I gave is 400.02 Q to 0. 0 to 0. Correct. Q to 2 0. And the state opposes that as instruction. Correct. It's in the correct. Um, well, if you like. I've considered this. I've, actually, that's why I'm a little delayed here. In the Carruthers decision, which, frankly, there's very little, frankly, there's no case law on this. We're, we're breaking ground. I'm trying to rule fairly to your client, but also in accordance with the law. The Carruthers decision, the concurring decision, talks about the statutory provision for conducting a mental health examination are notes that evidence uh, obtained during that cannot be used for purposes as you're seeking to exclude. But the concurring opinion also states that the alternative manner that would be Rule 45 contains some, no such restrictions. Applying that finding, which I agree with, Rule 25 does not limit what can be used or not used. And finding that the examination of your client was conducted under the auspices of Rule 25, uh, as evidenced by the state motion, I'm going to deny the request to give the jury the instruction requested. And I'll show that over your objection. Now that the continuing objection on that really issue. Yes, sir. With regard to Dr. Frank's testimony and the possibility of Dr. Dean's testimony. Yes, sir. That's how I was interpreting it. I mean, we can make a record once we get to the final instruction conference regarding that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Pash, I wasn't trying to cut you off, but knowing how I was going to rule, do you wish to supplement? No, I can make the recommendation to make when we have the instruction conference. All right. That, my ruling is, and again, is because this is consented to under Rule 25, that the restrictions contained in Section 552 are not applicable, and therefore the instruction itself is not required, subject to a continuing objection by the defense. Are you going to call Dr. Franks? We yeah. are. All right. And this is just for housekeeping purposes. Do you think we'll be finished today? Yes, I do. I can't speak for anybody else, but I do. Okay. All right. Are we ready for the jury then? Yes, sir. Mr. Barry, are you ready? We are. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please, be you Thank you. Mr. Perry, do you have another witness? Yes, Judge. I yes. saw Dr. Kent Frank. Dr. Frank, come on up. Afternoon. Have a seat, okay? And then I'll swear you in the moisture sitting with you. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give and the cause now pending before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, you got I do. Thank you. There's not a lot of room there. If you want to set things there, that's fine too. Thank you. Cover Jesus. Um, please tell us your name. Kent Wesley Franks. And can you tell us how you're employed? I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm in private practice. And how long have you been a clinical psychologist? I obtained my PhD in 1987. What is a clinical psychologist? Clinical psychology is the study of behavior. And how does one become a clinical psychologist? Well, it entails uh, an undergraduate degree, minors in psychology, master's degree, and then a PhD in psychology. And then if you practice, you have to get a license. Where did you get your undergraduate degree from? I went to Missouri State University here in town. And you say you have a master's degree? I do. From where? California School of Professional Psychology. And then your PhD? It's from the same school. And when did you get your PhD? 1987. Now, 
what type of clinical psychology do you practice? Do you have a specific type? I've always been a forensic psychologist. Okay. And, and how does that differ from uh, anything else? I mean, how, how, what is a clinical psychologist? I'm sorry, I'm distracting for just one moment. What is a forensic psychologist? I apologize. Well, it's where psychology intersects with the law, where behavior intersects with the law. And as a forensic psychologist, what kinds of things would you, what kinds of evaluations would you be doing? Mostly over the years, I've done competency to stand trial evaluations, determine whether or not someone is legally insane at the time of committing a crime, risk assessment evaluations to determine whether or not someone can be safely and effectively managed in the community, what level of structure they will require, um, and a lot of sex offender evaluations to determine their risk of reoffense and their diagnosis. Do you have any idea how many of these evaluations you conducted in, in the field of forensic psychology? About 2,000 in the last 30 years. Any idea how many of those are worked for the state of Missouri? I moved to Missouri from California in 2004, and I've done sexual predator evaluations for the Attorney General's office. I uh, probably done about 50 of those evaluations for the Missouri Attorney General, and a few evaluations for the United States Attorney on aggravated sex offender cases. And how many do you think you've done for the criminal defense bar? Do you have any idea? The rest of them. So, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of a, of a thousand evaluations for defense attorneys. <clears throat> Can you tell us what a CV is? What's a CV? Curriculum Vitae. And I'm going to tell you in one moment. So we get marked. But I'm going to mark as Defense Exhibit A. And ask you if you recognize this document. It's a multi page document. Just my personal opinion. Yes, sir. This is my curriculum vitae. And how many pages is that? Document. It's five. And what all is is listed in that document in terms of your experience and training and whatnot? Well, it goes through my education and my occupational history and my uh, presentations and publications. Yes, I would ask if it's exhibit A be admitted in evidence. No objection that we receive without objection. Now, have you ever testified in a criminal case before? I have. How many times do you have a criminal case? I think about 120. And in those 120 cases, were you ever declared an expert? I always was. So every time you testified in a criminal case, it was as an expert? After I got licensed, I testified once as an intern because I was working in a forensic facility and I was not qualified then, but it was only because I wasn't licensed. After I'd been licensed, I was qualified. Judge, I would ask the court to uh, declare him an expert on this issue. On the issue of? As a, as a forensic psychologist. I can actually lay more foundation if you want me to. Which direction? I actually don't think that's the appropriate rule. I think you may allow him to testify as an expert. I don't think it's proper for the court to declare anyone an expert to comment on their qualifications. But I, think, I, I think that may be the actual methodology. We would, we would ask the judge. I would allow Dr. Franks to testify on the area of forensic psychology. Are you familiar with autism? Yes. Tell us what autism is. It's a neurological disorder. It's considered brain-based, and it's characterized by two different things. The first is the impairment in social abilities, the ability to read social cues, to understand nonverbal cues, and to pick up on the appropriate emotional responses of other people. Folks with autism suffer from severe deficits in their social behavior. And then the second prong is repetitive stereotype movements. They tend to collect things, 
They have uh, an insistence upon sameness. They don't like changes in their routine. Everything needs to be exactly the same. And there will be large collections, and it could be anything. It could be rocks, it could be action figures, it could be data and information. But those are the two, the two primary characteristics. Are you familiar with the DSM? Yes. What is the DSM? What does that stand for? It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's, it's updated every few years, and it lists the criteria for the various mental disorders. And that's the, the book that we use to make diagnoses. <laughs> what is the current volume of the DSM? Five. And in the DSM-5, is autism listed as one of as one of the diagnoses? It is. It's called autism spectrum disorder. And how does autism and autism spectrum disorder differ? Or well, does it? Autism spectrum disorder is the official name as, as it's listed in the DSM-5. Autism is more of a the term that has been used over the years. The diagnosis was updated in the most recent DSM, and it was changed to autism spectrum disorder. And that's just simply what we call it now. Are there more than one uh, more than one on the autism spectrum disorder? Is there more than one autism spectrum disorder? Uh, that is the main diagnosis. There are other developmental disorders, but there's only one autism spectrum disorder. But it's considered a range. That's why they call it a spectrum. So there's cases that vary in severity, level one, level two, and level three. That's what I was getting at. They're level three. Can you describe the, the three levels, one, two, and three? Starting with the most severe. Right. Level one is somebody that can function adequately with support. Um, they need structure. They need someone to help them make decisions adapt to social situations, and provide guidance for them. But they can function out in the world. Sometimes they can get jobs. Sometimes they can participate in, in higher education classes. And a lot of times they can have a family and, and have a life, an independent life, and function independently as long as they're getting help. Level two is somebody that continues to demonstrate impairment even though they're in a structured situation even though they're getting help and someone is basically looking out for their needs, their activities of daily living, helping them with grooming, cooking, laundry, and all of those things. And despite that level of structure and help, they're still having impairment. And then level three is the most profound level of disorder, and that would be somebody who's characterized with severe deficits in their ability to take care of themselves, communicate, solve problems, and, and basically function in any meaningful way. Do you have any experience with people with autism? I do. Tell us about your experience with people with autism. Well, it, it wasn't added in, to the DSM until 1994. And so it's, uh, the disorder has been known since the 1940s. But as research has accumulated, it's become much more Clinicians are looking for it more than we used to because there's a lot more that's known about it. And so in the work that I do in evaluating people uh, for the courts, I've learned how to uh, administer the tests, I've learned how to identify it, and I've gone to training so that to increase my knowledge about the disorder over the last 10 years. What, cha what challenges would children with autism typically have? The most profound challenge is going to be interpersonal. They're going to have difficulty with making friends. They're going to have a hard time and generally be unable to establish a social niche. They're going to be the kids that don't fit in, that live on the fringes. They're oftentimes bullied. Their peers think they're weird. And they just never really fit in. And so they're solitary. And they play by themselves. And they tend to be drawn towards the television video games, maybe animals. They get along better with things than they do with people. And so as a result of that, usually they're by themselves and their social experiences are really negative. And so that reinforces the isolation. They get to be afraid to be around people because they'll get picked on and, and they're bullied and embarrassed. 
The challenges do adolescents with autism spectrum disorder have as they become adults? Well, they have many of the same challenges because when you get into high school, peer pressure is obviously very important. And so it's hard for them to find a niche, a group. Sometimes they'll associate with the kids that play video games, the gamers, and they'll be able to make some friends in that context. But essentially, they're going to be regarded as unusual, different. And a lot of times they're going to be shunned by their peer group. And so that creates a host of problems with regard to self-esteem, self-image, the way that you feel about yourself and your confidence. You tend to withdraw and, and avoid social situations. So what challenges would adults in general face who, who are on the autism spectrum disorder? Well, the research has shown that when kids get out of high school, they lose that structure. So usually these are people who are involved in special classes behavioral classes, special education, and there's, there's folks that are working with them and trying to help them do their school work and provide structure. When they get out of high school, they lose that. And so depending upon their socioeconomic status and their cognitive abilities, a lot of times their functioning declines when they get out of high school because they don't have the help that they were having before. It depends a lot on their cognitive abilities. If, if they don't have a cognitive disability, and their intelligence is at least average or low average, the outcomes are oftentimes better. It also depends on family support and if they have somebody that's trying to help them. If they don't, the outcomes are often, often negative. They have difficulty finding employment, establishing families, and oftentimes, I think, sort of exist on the fringes. How could one on the autism spectrum disorder, how could it affect their decision making? Decision-making is really hard. These are folks that, it's a neurological disorder, and so their ability to adapt and solve problems and think on their feet is impaired by definition. And so that's why they like routine, they like sameness, they like to collect things, because they can understand that. If they venture outside of their safety zone, they have a lot of problems, especially a stimulating, complex social environment. They're not going to do well in that situation at all. What impairments could they face in their daily life? It could be a range of impairment depending upon the severity of this, their disorder. At the mild end, it would just be difficulty connecting with people, loneliness, isolation, depression, anxiety, uh, problems that are associated with trying to connect with other people. At the more severe end of the spectrum, they could put themselves into dangerous situations. There was a lack of reasoning and they could, they, unless someone is looking out for them, they could venture into all kinds of situations that ultimately could be dangerous or harmful for them. We've, we've heard some discussion of Asperger's syndrome. What, tell us what that is. Asperger's was named after the person, Dr. Asperger's, who originally identified the disorder. And it's considered the mild form of autism. It's uh, considered a higher functioning form of autism. With Asperger's, you don't have the cognitive impairment. Their intelligence is either in the average or low average range. Uh, but there's still the social impairment. There's the difficulty connecting with people and understanding emotional give and take. And they also have the insistence on sameness and routine and the collecting behaviors. They just don't have the cognitive disability. And do we use that term anymore? It was removed because autism is considered a spectrum disorder. And so level one on the autism spectrum disorder would probably be consistent with what used to be known as, as Asperger's disorder. Do you know somebody by the name of Nicholas Godijohn? Yes. How do you know Mr. Godijohn? I evaluated him. Okay. And, and when did you uh, meet with him? I saw him the first time for seven hours at the Greene County Detention Facility on December 29, 2015. And then I saw him the second time on July 29, 2016. And how many hours did you meet with him that time? 
Four hours. And is that unusual to meet with somebody for that long, given the kind of evaluation you're doing? No, it's not unusual. I also interviewed his dad for an hour on the telephone. And is that something you typically do in an evaluation, interview a family member? It's not unusual. Why did you do it in this case? There is a relatives questionnaire for the autism spectrum disorder where you, it's a rating scale, and I wanted to uh, administer that to his father, and so we did that over the telephone. And I also wanted to get additional background information from his father. When you do an evaluation, is it just an interview, or is there other aspects of, of the evaluation? Well, for me, I, I always begin with a fairly lengthy biographical interview, and I get their history. And then once that's completed, depending upon the case, I follow up with psychological testing. And why do you get the biographical information? Why is that important? Well, the history is what determines who we are. The, our childhood is extremely important in our psychological development. And so if you understand the nature of a person's childhood, you will know a lot about why they are, who they are as an adult. And then it's important to gather as much information as you can to arrive at the correct diagnosis and the correct conceptualization of the case. So you gather as much information as you can from as many sources as you can, you know, in the hopes of developing an accurate evaluation. Now, what kind of testing did you conduct uh, during your evaluation of Mr. Godidon? I gave him an IQ test, the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, fourth edition, the current one that's being used in the field. I administered the wide range achievement test to evaluate his reading, spelling, and arithmetic abilities. I used two personality tests. Actually, I used three. The Rorschach Ink Block Test, the MNPI, which stands for Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And then I used an old test uh, called the Thematic A Perception Test because it uh, portrays interpersonal situations. And sometimes it's used in people with autism spectrum disorders to help you evaluate their understanding of people and social situations. And so. Can you slow it down just a tad? Yes, sir. I'm trying to keep up, and I know some of the viewers are using terms that may not be familiar with dogs. Understood. Thank you. Basically, what I, I wanted to say is it's an old test. I don't always use it, but sometimes it's helpful with autism spectrum disorder because you, you show them pictures of social situations and ask them to make up a story that goes with it. And you can get an idea of how they conceptualize social situations from what they come up with. <clears throat> now, you, you indicated that you did a biography of Mr. Godijan, is that correct? I did, I took his history. Can you tell us a little bit about his birth? Is there anything notable as a, as a psychologist about his birth, or what you know about it? His father reported to me that some indication his mother might have drank during the pregnancy, and there, were, there might have been some drug use. He knew about one occasion for each. The birth was complicated. She was in labor, I think for 13 hours, and the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. And they used a suction cup to deliver him. And um, the doctors told his father that his brain may have been deprived of oxygen for a period of time during the delivery because of the umbilical cord. And what, um, when was he born? His birthday is May 20, 1989. Did you find anything about his family life? I did. As he was growing up. Tell us about that. Well, his mom and dad were married. They split up when he was about four years old. It was not a happy marriage. They did not get along very well. He stayed with his mother following the separation. She worked, and he was not very attentive to it. And so he spent a lot of time by himself. In addition to having autism spectrum disorder, he was actually physically alone for much of his childhood. And she wasn't very attentive to him, and it didn't sound like they had a very close bond. He spent some time with his father, but his mother was the custodial parent. And there were several incidents. Kind of jacked unless this is somehow to get his diagnosis. Will this help us to lead to your diagnosis? I believe it will. Well, I'm going to allow for the time being to get me far field. 
finish your thought. There was an incident where she worked as a waitress and brought home some old food, and and uh, he ate it and became really sick. And there was some evidence to suggest that she didn't take care of his medical needs the way that she should have. And then ultimately he went to live with his father when he was a teenager and came back to live with his mother when he was about 16 or 17 years old. And I think the situation was improved by that time. What kind of educational level did he acquire? He graduated from high school, but he was a lifelong special education student. The autism was diagnosed when he was in the second grade. And so he was in uh, very structured classes as a result of that. And then when he was about 13 years old, they changed the diagnosis to Asperger's. But he continued to be in special education classes throughout high school. What about his work history? He's only had one job. He was a social security recipient in school by virtue of the autism. And then he worked at a, a pizza parlor and he was the person that stood outside with a sign. And he did that for 13 months. Uh, they tried to have him work in a kitchen. At least that's what he told me. And he was unsuccessful, he dropped the pizza. So he only worked part-time holding a sign outside the store and then ultimately had an interpersonal conflict with someone inside the restaurant. And afterwards, um, he applied for Social Security and it was granted when he was 21 years old. And so he's been on disability since that time. Are you aware of any work skills he possesses? No, he doesn't have any work skills. What about his relationship history, romantic relationship history? His father told me he had one girlfriend. He had a basically one friend who suffered from an intellectual disability. And he had a sister. His sister was younger and she suffered from autism. And Nick formed a relationship with her and that was his girlfriend for a period of months. And they had a sexual relationship. He told me that he also had a girlfriend when he was younger. His father did not confirm that. So his relationship history is extremely limited. And I think really the only confirmed romantic relationship he had was with another person who had autism. Did you review any records as part of this evaluation? I did. What records did you review? I reviewed some school records. I reviewed his social security records from um, when he was in high school and when he was making his application to Social Security and then they have to do yearly updates on the Social Security to maintain eligibility and I reviewed those and um, there was a disability report by Dr. Goldstein in 2010 and then of course I reviewed the, his high school records and I reviewed the police reports and the videotapes associated with this case. Did you speak with anybody in addition to his father and, and Mr. Bogum as part of this evaluation? No, not that I can recall. Now, in many cases, you met with him twice. Uh, was there anything notable about his appearance when you met with him in, in your interviews? Uh, his grooming and hygiene has always been poor. That's something that was apparent in the school records. It's never, he's never, he's always needed reminders to shower, brush his hair, and brush his teeth. And that was evident when I saw him. Uh, he has a tendency to let his beard grow out in an untrimmed manner, sometimes let his hair grow out in an untrimmed manner. So I, 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 there were deficits in his grooming and hygiene consistent with his history. Why is that important to you as a psychologist? It shows a lack of self-care, a lack of self-management. I think it's characteristic of his disorder. Did it change between your two interviews? Not really. He had cut his hair the time I saw him and gained a little bit of weight when I saw him the second time, but it was still evident. Did you know his mood? Yes. Can you, can you tell us what, what you would what you mean by when you say mood? What, what did you know about his mood and what is that? He was sad. Both of the times that I've seen him, it's difficult to assess somebody that has autism. It's hard to assess their mood. They're not very communicative. That's part of the disorders. They don't connect with people and they don't describe themselves very well. 
And so it's getting a window into what his internal world is like. It's hard. And so uh, as best I could determine, it's kind of sad, but his emotions are kind of flat. doesn't show a lot of emotion. He's not real reactive in that way. Now, you've also had an opportunity to view a video of the police interview. Is that correct? I did. Did you notice anything about him in the police interview, aside from what he said, just his appearance, his mood? Well, he was under a lot of stress at that point in time. I noticed he talked to himself a lot. And they uh, were not in the room with him. And he was left by himself. He talked to himself. And I thought that was sort of unusual. And then I didn't think his eye contact was very good with the officers. It wasn't very good when he was with me. And that's characteristic of autism spectrum disorder. What is cognition? It basically refers to the ability to think and solve problems. It's kind of synonymous with intelligence. What about reasoning? Is that? That's a related term. Reasoning is the ability to think through a problem. Um, to come to a situation, there's a problem that needs to be solved, and your reasoning ability reflects your capability to solve that problem adaptively. Did you consider his cognition and reasoning? I'm sorry? Did you consider his cognition and reasoning when you were evaluating him? Absolutely. What did you conclude? Well, I gave him an IQ test, and he was functioning in the, the low average range altogether. But there's a lot of variability in his intellectual abilities. In other words, most people's intelligence is fairly consistent across different areas. There's verbal intelligence. There's the ability to work with your hands. There's memory. And then there's concentration. He had areas where he functioned fairly well. And then in other areas, he functioned in a, a fairly poor manner. Now, you mentioned you had him do some tests. Let's talk about some of these tests. Uh, and I wrote some of them down. Um, I'm going to them down. Personality tests, for example. You mentioned a couple of those. Tell us what, what kind of personality tests, how many did you have him do? Three. Three? And they were? The Rorschach. Uh-huh. The MMPI. Second edition. Revised. The restructured edition. M -M I'm sorry. MNPI 2 RF. Okay. That all three? And the thematic A perception test. Thematic? What's the second word? A perception test. They call it the TAT. Let's start with the Rorschach. Tell us what the Rorschach test is. Well, the Rorschach is the ink blots. It's been portrayed on television over the years. Sometimes people make fun of it. The fact of the matter is that it's a well-validated test that's been around since the 1920s. It's been administered millions of times. And there was a new scoring system that was developed based upon international norms in 2011. And one of the things that the Rorschach test does very well is measure reality testing which is the ability to perceive your surroundings in an accurate manner. And that was the main reason that I administered it. It also provides information about a person's social understanding, their understanding of people, and the ability to interact with others in a cooperative way. And did you come up with a result as of, after this test? I did. What was your conclusion or result? His ability to perceive reality is tenuous. He had a psychotic episode when he was 13 years old and hallucinated and talked about hearing seven or eight different kinds of voices. His mother in the social security records talked about impaired reality testing, that he had difficulty perceiving reality accurately. <clears throat> On the Rorschach test, you look at pictures that resemble things like a bat. And if you look at a bat and you see something else, that is an impaired perception. And there was a significant amount of that, suggesting that his perception of the world around him is often inaccurate. And people usually will have human representations on the test. If you're interested in humans, you'll see humans on the eight plots. You didn't see a one. Not a fictional human, not a real human, or not a human part. None of, nothing. No cooperative human movement. And that suggests 
really deficient social understanding, deficient understanding of people, a lack of interest in people, really. What about the UNPI test? The UNPI test is a self-report, true-false test. Uh, there's 330 some odd items. They answer true or false to those. There are different scales that measure things like depression, anxiety, mania, paranoia, uh, disturbed thinking, and I had him fill that out. And did you come to any conclusions as a result of that test? I did. What were those? He reported a lot of symptoms. He, he was not functioning very well at the time that I saw him. He talked about having uh, some unusual sensory and perceptual experiences at that time. He was experiencing some depression and he was also experiencing some paranoia. And then the, the third test that you said you administered was the thematic and perception test? Yeah. And tell us a little bit about how you do that test. It's a, as I said, it's a series of pictures that depend and ask them to make up a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end to correspond with the pictures. And what was the result of that test? Very primitive, very basic and concrete stories with very little understanding of the motivations of the characters. It's very, uh, very simplistic. Now, in your uh, evaluation, in particular your evaluation of Mr. Gojibon, do you often use proverbs to try to determine a person's thinking? I always do. Okay. Tell us a little bit about why you do that. Well, there's a section called the mental status examination, and part of that section is I ask them proverbs to see if they can think abstractly. And so uh, things like strike well, the iron is hot, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, Rome wasn't built in a day, don't cry over spilled milk. And if they can provide an abstract interpretation, they're higher up the developmental ladder than somebody that interprets it concretely. And so uh, I did that with, with Nick. Do you remember which particular saying you used with, with Mr. Cody John? Can I refer to my report for this part? Yes, and we probably ought to mark it as an exhibit. You don't know me? I'll mark it as Nick's exhibit B. Just for evidentiary purposes, exactly. Yes, yeah, for identification purposes at this point. So don't read it out loud, Doctor. Okay. Read it to yourself. Understood. Okay. You can see it refreshes your recollection. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Which which particular proverbs did you use with Mister Brody John? Don't cry over spilled milk. Rome wasn't built in a day, and a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Let's start with the first one. Don't cry over spilled milk. What was his response to that? How did he finish that, that particular proverb or saying? He gave an abstract interpretation for that. He said, don't cry over a situation that isn't as big as it seems. Okay. Did that tell you anything? That was good. That showed some capacity for abstract thought. Okay. I think the next one you said was Rome was not built in a day. Yes. How did he finish that particular one? He told me he didn't know what that meant. Okay. What does that tell you? Difficulty with abstract thought. A bird in a hand is worth two in the bush. Is that the next one? Yes. And what? how did he respond to that? Or how did he complete that? He couldn't interpret that one either. He said he didn't know what the last two meant. Do you use hypotheticals? I do. In your testing? I do. Why? Judgment questions. You, you give somebody a hypothetical scenario and ask them how they would respond to it. And it's a way of getting a, an idea of their judgment. And did you use any hypotheticals in the evaluation of Mr. Goody John? I did. Which ones did you use? The first one, I use these all the time. I, I like them. Uh, so the first one was, you're sitting in a crowded movie theater and you're watching a movie, the place is packed, and you're the first one to see smoke and fire in the building. Well, what should you do? Why do you ask that? Well, there's a right answer to it, and there's a wrong answer to it, and so it, it's 
It's a way to assess judgment. And what was his answer in the evaluation? Probably yell fire and run out of the building. Do you consider that to be the right answer? No, that's the exact thing you don't want to do, because if you yell fire, you're going to create panic. You asked him any other hypotheticals? I did. And what was that? You're walking beside a lake, and you see a small child playing alone, unsupervised, out at the end of a pier, next to the water. What would you do? And what was his response to that? <clears throat> his judgment was better in that situation. He said, I'd probably ask them where their parents are and contact the authorities. I'd try and find the parents of the child, maybe. And you thought that was a better answer? Yeah, that's basically what you're supposed to do, is make sure that the child is uh, not unattended and get help. Dr. Franks, earlier you mentioned the IQ test. You, you administered an IQ test. Um, you, what is the name of the IQ test you administered? It's called the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, 4th edition. The Wexler. Why, I'm sorry, why did you use that? That's the standard in the field for evaluating IQ. Tell us a little bit about the test. It was broken up into four components, and they're each considered an aspect of intelligence. One is called verbal comprehension. Those are verbal tests, vocabulary, information. Uh, there's one called similarities that measures abstract reasoning. And then there's another subscale that is called perceptual reasoning. Those are tests that involve visual problems. One is putting blocks together to make geometric patterns, and then the other one is uh, a maze test. And then there's uh, working memory, which is the ability to hold something in memory while you perform an operation or a manipulation with it. And the last one is called processing speed, and that's the ability to process novel information and novel stimuli. And then do you have an overall IQ that you determine from all of these? Yes. Let's take the one at a time. I think you mentioned verbal communication. What what does that tell you as a as a psychologist when you when you look at that? When you get a score there. Well, it's the ability to solve verbally presented problems. So some people are verbal problem solvers, some are more visual. And if they do well on the verbal, then that means that if they hear something, they're going to have a better time solving it if they score higher on the verbal subtests. Did you get a score, a raw score, in his verbal communication? I did. And what is that raw score? Uh, his index score was 96. That's based upon a standard score, and the mean would be 100. So his, his verbal comprehension was average. Okay. And did you come up with a percentile? 39th percentile. And can you tell us what that means, so we're all clear what you mean by 39 percentile. That's where he would rank with 100 being the highest. Percentile rank is based upon 0 to 100. And it's basically your place in the normative sample of people that have taken this test. You also mentioned working memory. Tell us what that is. Working memory is the ability to hold something in, in memory and perform an operation or a manipulation with it. On this test, it's measured by giving somebody a string of digits, then they have to repeat them back to you in reverse order. And then also given some random digits, and they have to sequence them from lowest to highest. Did you come up with a score? Yes. What is the raw score in working memory? 77. Mm -hmm. Did you come up with a percentile where that would rank? Yes. What's that? Sixth. The 94% of the population would have a higher score, is that what you're saying? That's correct. What about perceptual reasoning? What is that? That's the ability to solve problems visually, sometimes with your hands, sometimes just visually. Did you come up with a raw score there? Yes. What was that? It was 90. What percentile would that be? 25th. What about processing speed? What is that? Processing speed is the ability to look at novel information and reproduce it in some manner, integrate it and reproduce it. Did you come up with a raw score? I did. What's that? 74. What percentile would that be? Fourth. Again, 96, if I'm adding right, percent of the population would be higher. That's right. Did you come up with an overall IQ for Mr. Goody John? 
I did. What's that? 82. And what percentile would that be? 12. 12th percentile. Now, let's talk a little bit about that overall score. We're, are there different categories of, of functioning when one has higher or lower IQs? The different categories? Yes. What, what are the categories? Well, there's superior, high average, average, low average, borderline, and deficient. And how does one fit in one of the categories? Is it based on, on his or her score? Well, it would be generally based upon the full-scale IQ. However, when there's so much variability or spread in the score, sometimes the, ver the overall IQ is not the most representative score because the person does really well on some things and poorly on others. Is that what you noticed in this case? Yes, a lot of variability, a lot of spread in his scores. And what did that tell you as a psychologist? Sometimes it's, you, it's associated with neuropsychological impairment. Autism is considered a brain-based disorder, a neurological disorder, and I think that this is symptomatic of that. Working memory and processing speed are sensitive to neuropsychological impairment, and that was his course performance. And where did his overall IQ rank in, in terms of the categories? He would be considered low average, although processing speed and working memory were borderline. All these scores taken together, what does that tell you about Mr. Bill John? Generally speaking, his overall IQ is low average. His ability to comprehend verbal information is within the average range. His visual motor problem solving is in the average range. He's going to have difficulty processing information. His memory is not very good. Particularly if he has to remember something and manipulate it in some way, he's going to struggle with that. Now, tell us what the wide range achievement test is. It's an academic achievement test. It measures reading, spelling, and arithmetic. Did you do that test with Mr. Godin? I did. Tell us what categories you're looking at in that test. I administered the reading, spelling, and math computation subtests. Tell us, how do you score that when you read Is there a... I'll just make it a question. Let's start with reading. Did you achieve a score with Mr. Dodi John on reading? Yes. What was that score? His standard score was 93, based upon a mean of 100, so that's average. That's just sight reading ability, the ability to work at a, look at a word and pronounce it correctly. And, and what percentage of the population would that put him in? Uh, he was at the 32nd percentile. What about spelling? What score did he get there? His standard score was 102 and a percentile rank of 55. What about math computation? Math was significantly lower. It was at the 75th percentile, I'm sorry, the 75th standard score and a percentile rank of 5. Did you do any neurological screening? I did. What is neurological screening? Well, these are processing tests. They're considered screening tests. And uh, if somebody performs in the impaired range on them, it provides some evidence that they're suffering from neuropsychological deficits. What was the result of your visual screening test? They were both considered processing tests, and he performed in the impaired range on both of them. His processing speed is low, and that's evidence of neuropsychological impairment. What about symbol digit modalities? Did you do that? I did. And what did you find there? He was b beneath the 10th percentile. His processing speed is slow. Now, you talked a little bit about having um, evaluated him. Did you draw any conclusions about uh, Mr. Gody John and as it relates to uh, DSM-5, where he may be on that? Yes. What did you What did you conclude? He has an autism spectrum disorder. I also administered an autism quotient test, uh, and he was positive on that. And it supported the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, and in my opinion, it was at the level two. Is that consistent with his... Earlier diagnosis? It's uh, consistent with 
his school records, his social security records, and an evaluation that was performed by Dr. Goldstein in 2010. Do you have testing that you do to help determine this? Yeah, the autism? Yes. Yes. And what kind of testing do you do? What is it called, first of all? I, I use the autism quote, and uh, it's based upon three tests. The first is an autism questionnaire, and it's basic autism questions about primarily social behavior and collecting behavior. There's a second test that's called the empathy quote. People who suffer from autism have deficits in empathy. It's called the theory of the mind. They have difficulty understanding other people's points of view. They cannot put themselves in someone else's shoes. The empathy quote helps measure that. And then the third is the relatives questionnaire. And I administered that with his dad over the telephone. Do you score these things? Yes. Okay. And how do you score the first one, the autism questionnaire? Well, I have a spreadsheet and type in the scores. I had to fill them out on a form and then I entered them into the spreadsheet and the computer scored it. And did you come up with a score? I did. What, what, tell us what the score is and talk a little bit about that. On the autism spectrum quotient, the AQ, you scored 30. What does that mean to you? It probably doesn't mean much to any of us since we don't really understand it, but what does it mean to you? Uh, it's in the high range. Most people with autism spectrum disorders score around 32, according to the research on the scale. He scored at 30, and it would be considered a high score. He's endorsing a lot of symptoms of autistic spectrum disorder. What about the empathy portion? Huh? What kind of score did you get on that? He obtained a score of 27. What did that do? <laughs> Again, that was in the impaired range. He showed significant deficits in empathy or the ability to understand other people and put himself in their shoes and understand others, their emotional perspectives, empathy. He's deficient in it. In the relatives questionnaire, what would that tell you? Is that assuming you'd be talking to another, a third person? Right? His father. Uh, his father reported he had a lot of autistic symptoms, he had difficulty forming relationships with peers. There was some rocking behavior, a little bit of head banging behavior as a kid. He would bang his head against walls while he rocked. He collected things like rocks, uh, action figures, very little peer development while he was growing up. He never formed a social niche. He was solitary. <laughs> And the relatives questionnaire was positive for autism spectrum disorder. All three of these were. Overall, what do these tests tell you about Nicholas Cody Jr.? That he has an autism spectrum disorder. He, and characterized by severe deficits in social understanding, social reciprocity, understanding nonverbal cues, understanding emotions, and then an insistence on sameness. Uh, inability to venture outside of this house and the collective behaviors that's characteristic of the disorder. And did you draw an ultimate conclusion regarding, um, let me start with, to a reasonable degree of, science, of psychological certainty, what did you diagnose Mr. Go John with? Autism spectrum disorder, level two. Anything else that you added to that? No. Anything about support? Requiring substantial support with accompanying intellectual impairment. And was that part of your diagnosis? Yes. What does that mean, requiring substantial support with accompanying intellectual impairment? It's a specifier in the DSM-5. It means that he requires substantial support in order to be able to function adequately. He needs supervision and he needs structure or he could pose a danger to himself or others. One thing. Judge, can we make a brief record if you want? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Good job.
And Mr. Perry, you might reference this decision by the verdict. You must not discuss this case among yourselves or with others or permit anyone to discuss it in your hearing. You should not form or express any opinion about the case until it is finally given to you to decide. Do not do any research or investigation on your own about any matter regarding this case or anyone involved with the trial. Do not communicate with others about the case by any means. Do not read, view, or listen to any newspaper, radio, electronic communication from the internet or television report of the trial. It's 2.48, my old reading says for about five after three, and we'll come back and continue with Dr. Clayton. All right.